Welcome to West Palm Under Construction. I'm Leslie Garrett. Today I'm with Rick Green. He is the Development Services Director for the City of West Palm Beach. And he's been on both sides of the aisle. You've been in the construction industry practically your entire career, is that correct? Well, I spent my first 13 years working here with the City of West Palm Beach back in the 90s. Um, mm -hmm. I then worked on the, uh, the private side for two national home builders for under the 13 years. And I'm pleased to be back in West Palm Beach because there's a lot of exciting projects happening right now. And your expertise is in the planning and the development stage. My background is in planning. I have an undergraduate and a master's degree in planning. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what I've studied and what I've been doing, but really been in all aspects of, of planning and construction. Well, tell us about your department and the divisions that you're working with. Okay. The uh, Development Services Department is, is broken into um, three divisions. We have Great. a planning division that works closely with applicants when they're coming in with new projects. We sit down with them, help them plan and design um, what's best for the project and work with them to try to achieve what they're trying to accomplish within the goals of, of what the city is desiring. Once that project is approved, they then go to our building division. Um, our building division actually reviews the permits, they do the plans, the inspections for the project. And then uh, thirdly, we have a code enforcement division, and that code enforcement division is ensuring that properties are kept up to city codes and all regulations are being met and adhered to. Now, when the builder comes, do they already have the site picked out for the construction project and that's ready to go and they just need your approval? Generally, what we try to do is it's, it's a very interactive process. Um, again, we try to encourage and we recognize that for any project to be successful and for the city to get the type of projects they like, it really has to be a public-private partnership. So we work very closely with applicants when they come in. Um, we certainly encourage a what we call a pre-application conference. So while the idea is still germinating in their mind, they come in and meet with us. They say they're looking at this piece of property. What can we do? This is what we'd like to do. Um, and then we really start that relationship very early on in the process. Um, as part of that discussion, as they're moving forward, we certainly encourage them to meet with neighborhood groups. Mm -hmm. We give them contacts, people they should be discussing the project with. And then we try to get as much feedback into the process, both from the city side as well as from the neighborhood side into the project. Now, how long could this process take? Well, once we have the pre-app, and, and again, we don't charge for that process, so we mm -hmm. encourage developers and applicants to meet with city staff, whether it's planning, whether it's building, um, spend as much time as they need. Once they mm -hmm. formally submit, um, we then take them through a process that in the best scenario is about three to four months. So we try to get them through our process pretty quickly. Um, after the formal application is made, we have what is known as a plans and plats review committee. Mm -hmm. And at that meeting, we sit down with representatives from different departments. So we'll have police, fire, engineering, utilities, planning, building, all, all representatives that will eventually be reviewing these plans. Mm -hmm. So if they see anything early on in the process, at that meeting, we invite the applicant to sit down. It's very informal. And then we go over the plans and talk about some of the issues that we might see. Now, what do you see in terms of the economic impact now? Are we seeing an upswing in construction happening in West Palm Beach? It's certainly getting a lot better. Um, mm -hmm. Our tax base has been declining over the last five or six years. Um, in our planning division side, um, we receive applications and certainly an applicant has to pay fees for us to process that um, request. and. Uh, and we have noticed that uh, this past year is the most revenue that our planning division has re received in the last seven years. We are on pace this current year to surpass what we did last year. So we are expecting and hopeful that it'll be the most revenue that our planning division has mm -hmm. witnessed in the last seven or eight years. If the planning project gets approved, then the next step obviously is to submit building permits, get the project built, which then turns into an increased tax base. So oh, certainly. we're definitely seeing a turnaround. We're certainly a lot busier than we have been in many, many years. Rick, tell us about some of the exciting projects that you have in development right now. Well, we've got the Palm Beach Outlets is probably a largest one. That was the uh, built in 1967. It was the first air-conditioned controlled mall in the state of Florida. Um, a group out of Boston, New England Development, has acquired that property. Um, they're going to be building a combination outlet portion and big box stores as well as some outlet, outlet mm -hmm. uh, stores. Um, the outlet portion is, is under construction, expects to open in February, probably will have about uh, 100 stores. And Excellent. while they haven't released all the tenant list yet, uh, we understand it's top quality stores. So we're, we're very excited and looking forward to that development coming That's amazing. In. And then there's supposed to be a new hotel next to the convention center, 400 rooms. We've been having some preliminary discussions. There's a 400 room hotel mm -hmm. that's going to be coming in mm -hmm. um, in the downtown area. There's actually quite a bit happening in the downtown. Um, another development, North Olive Place, 
a project consisting of approximately 400 hotel rooms um, north of Quadrille, which is an area that's been underserved, underdeveloped, so we're optimistic that a lot of things are happening on that north end with the redevelopment of First Bank, so mm -hmm. a lot of activities happening there. We've got other hotels proposed in the downtown area. Uh, we've been working with a group all aboard Florida who's going to build a high-speed rail line from Miami to Orlando with a stop in downtown West Palm Beach. Um, that rail line will accommodate a three-hour trip from Miami to Orlando. Um, Do we have a time frame for completion on that? They are moving very quickly. I think they'd like to try to be operational um, by the end of next year. So mm -hmm. um, they're buying a lot of property downtown and they're going to build a brand new station. So um, what we call the proverbial hole in the donut, if you will, between City Place and Clematis Street, um, we'll see a lot of activity and I think that's all going to be positive and a lot more development downtown. Now tell me about some of the other projects you have that are well, the, exciting. the beauty of the, of the mall is it's, it's caused a spin-off effect. We're seeing a lot of other developments happen. Um, just to the south, um, behind the Home Depot, just a little further east on Palm Beach Lakes Boulevard, uh, is a high-end multifamily development called Meisner Lakes, 548 mm. apartments. Um, wow. That received approval. They're working on architectural plans now. Um, we have another project just south on Executive Center Drive called the Jefferson. That's 282 apartments. Um, so that's going to be coming, and I think a lot of that too is a result of the outlet mall. Well, the rental in. market's been very hot too. I mean, it has. everybody's been wanting to rent as opposed to buy, and right. they're waiting to see what the home market prices are going to do before they jump in. So, a absolutely right. This may be filling a huge need that we've mm -hmm. seen. And our staff has spent a great deal of time working on the South Dixie corridor. But last year, we had a group called the Urban Land Institute come in and do a study of the South Dixie Corridor. Uh, a committee of nine persons has been formed. We've been meeting monthly to talk about how to help revitalize the, the South Dixie Corridor. Um, we're excited. There's a project called Villas on Antique Row, 46 mm -hmm. townhomes, of which 11 will be live work units right on um, South Dixie Highway. Um, they are doing construction work and moving forward with that um, project. We've seen a lot of other developments happening along the Dixie Corridor, so we're seeing a resurgence on the South Dixie Corridor as well. Now, I understand there's something happening with Rybrovich. Tell me about that project. Uh, there was a group called TRG Related out of mm -hmm. Miami that was proposing a, uh, um, a residential two twin condo residential project um, just north of the Rybrovich property. Um, they have come in. They haven't received their approvals just yet. Um, but they are partnering with Rybovich and doing a plan on the Northwood area. That's an area that we've spent a great deal of time trying to improve the Broadway corridor, trying mm -hmm. to bring more business into that area. Um, so those groups are working. Rybovich has been a great um, anchor in the North mm -hmm. End, a very successful company. They are looking to expand um, and they're always doing minor amendments and, and tweaks to their plan. But uh, we're excited that there might be a relationship being formed between the two entities that are going to help revitalize and invest more money into the whole Northwood and Broadway corridors. And it seems like there's a resurgence and almost a gentrification of that entire area. Absolutely. Everything seems to be much prettier, pristine. It seems like there's a lot of zoning and beautification going on everywhere yeah. I look. And, and that's where our code enforcement team helps as well mm -hmm. because they're trying to do a lot of, of cleanup in the area. Um, you, spoke also we will hear about the chronic nuisance activities that we're doing mm -hmm. and again just another measure to try to help clean up some of the properties in the north end and make them all more viable. Rick Green thank you so much for my being pleasure. with us today. My pleasure Leslie thank you very much. Stay with us everyone we'll be back after this. So, same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. Robert Brown, welcome. 
so Thank happy you. to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Now, Robert Brown is the building official for the city of West Palm Beach. Yes, right. And please explain the role that your division plays within the city. Okay, primarily the responsibility of the building division is to perform inspections for business, bus for, for building safety. So that's our primary responsibility. Um, our activities are issuing business tax receipts for, mm -hmm. for businesses that are in the city. Uh, what we, we also do is all related now to building, we take in building permit applications with building permit documents. Mm -hmm. We have meetings with building owners, architects, engineers, contractors about prospective building projects that they are, they are looking to start mm -hmm. in the city. Um, we review the documents that are submitted for permit. So we have plan reviewers who look at the plans and make sure they comply with Florida Building Code. We, of course, issue the permit, which is what, what uh, everyone, wants, wants, everyone wants to hear. Um, we then perform the inspections in the field based on those approved plans to make sure that the actual construction is the same as shown on those plans. If I'm a property owner and I have construction done on my property, shouldn't it be my problem if the, if the uh, construction doesn't go well or why do we need permits? Yeah, I would, I would say most people think that you know, it's my property, it's my problem if it doesn't go well. However, the Florida, Florida statutes state that we have to get building permits for safety reasons. Um, an example is if we have electrical work done on a property without a permit and without inspections, the owner, the visitors, new owners in the future, fire department personnel are all at higher risk of injury or death when they're in that building or around that building. So it's really liability issues. Now does that go for plumbing as well? Plumbing, electrical, the heavy Yeah, the, the, bu the building code covers all, all trades. Um, a lot of people don't think of plumbing as being dangerous, but um, you know, the, the sewer gases that can escape with improper plumbing can also be a health hazard. Now, are there any exemptions for permitting small projects? Some small projects are exempt from permitting. For instance, if you have minor work done which is repair, which are non-structural repair, and below a set value. Currently, that set value is $1,000. That kind of work wouldn't require a permit. Changing out a, a, a toilet or a sink doesn't require a permit. Kitchen cabinet replacement doesn't require, doesn't require a permit. I'm refacing my kitchen cabinets, no permit required. No permit okay. required for refacing But plumbing, cabinets. when I'm changing out the sink and the dishwasher and all the appliances. No permit required. Right. You know, but if the mm -hmm. project gets bigger than that, then it's best to check with the building official because most likely a permit is required. But certainly changing out bathrooms and pans and plumbing in those areas to avoid leaks. I would think that that so, would yeah, definitely th be required. Those, are, those, those areas mm -hmm. of work would definitely and require And what are the costs of the permits? Is it a scale? Is it a set? It's a amount? scale. The minimum permit fee currently is $80, just to give us a, a, some perspective there. Um, the permit cost does increase with the value of the project. So it starts at $80 and, and it, it increases with the, the larger projects and the higher value projects. But we're seeing a lot of, a lot of activity in, in our division, which is, which is a good thing. But certainly this applies to renovations too. It's not only new construction that you have to have the permits for, it's for the renovations as well. That's Are correct. you seeing more in, in the area of renovation than you do in the new construction right we now? We have, over the last few years, definitely seen more of the renovation being done than mm -hmm. new construction. We're starting to see an increase in interest and inquiries about new construction and that's that's always exciting. That's a positive sign yes. isn't it? Yes. In the past it's taken a long time to get permits. Are we fast tracking the permit process now? We we do. Staff are always looking to get permits out as quickly as possible. We have certain permit types that we can get out really quickly because of the size and the urgency of them. Mm -hmm. um, some examples of those would be a re-roof permit for a house. We don't mm -hmm. want to leave that house exposed without its right. roof covering so we issue those permits the same day. Um, other examples of permits that we can get out really quickly are um, AC equipment change outs, mm -hmm. no one wants to be without air conditioning equipment, water heater change outs, no one wants to be without, uh, without hot water. So those permits are issued the same day as well. Small, small repair type permits that only need review by one reviewer, mm -hmm. we can get those out in two days. Um, when you get to the bigger projects that require a plan review, uh, for instance, a, a new house mm -hmm. or a commercial, uh, commercial property build out, we require 14 days to get through those plans and the really big projects that uh, may be a new building and also the big 
commercial remodels, we need 30 days to get through those plans. Now, if you're an individual and you're applying for a building permit, one, where do you go right. to apply for the permit? Yes, you come to the City Hall mm -hmm. um, on Clamada Street. The Development Services Department is on the first floor. It's really the, the, closest, the closest department to the entrance of the building, so you can't miss us. And we have uh, front counter staff there that are willing and able to, to advise you uh, on your permit application. And if I'm doing a project, is it necessary for me to hire a licensed contractor to pull the permits, or can an individual pull their own permits? Individuals can pull their own permits. Uh, typically, they're called owner-builder permits. Mm -hmm. uh, so an owner can pull their own permit if if they're going to be occupying that space or that building themselves and if they are not going to be selling or renting that that building for at least a year okay so those the, under those circumstances an owner can get the permit themselves they must supervise the work themselves and if they hire somebody that person or that company must be licensed now if it's not an owner builder permit then of course we're looking now to see that we have a licensed contractor licensed in that scope mm -hmm. of work to to pull the permit what are some of the penalties for doing work without getting permit? Work done without permit. The penalties are, if our inspectors find that there's work done without permit, the, the options are either to remove the, the, the work that was done without permit or to pay a penalty on the permit application to, to bring it into compliance. That penalty is three times the normal permit fee, so it's an additional three times the cost of the permit. So get the permit. It, it pays to get the permit. You really, in paying a permit fee, you get a state licensed individual or a number of state licensed individuals looking at your project, making sure everything's safe. And really, if you look at it that way, it is actually good value for money. Now, what happens if a previous owner of a property has not pulled a permit, say, to do electrical work, and you don't find this out until you're past the closing table, or what happens then? Unfortunately, the current owner of a property is responsible mm -hmm. for any work that was done without permit. So what we do when we find that that has happened, we work with the current owner to make sure that they understand the work was done without permit. We help them through the process to get it permitted with the minimum delay to the, in their intended project or them continuing the enjoyment of their property. And also we try to minimize the cost for them in order to get plans and inspections done for the for And then the work. bringing it into compliance. I wonder how long that entire process would take. It really varies depending on the mm -hmm. size of the project and how much work is covered up. Sometimes when you do work without permit, you're covering up work that inspectors would need to see. So if it's done without permit and we come in after the fact, it's possible that we might ask for some of it to be opened up so we can check it. Mm. it sounds like a daunting process. Yes. And tell me about some of the other uh, projects that your divisions has been covering lately? Well, other, other activities in, in our, our division are the business tax uh, uh, receipt issuance. We are responsible for taking in applications for business tax. We, uh, we issue the business tax receipts. They were formerly known as occupational license. So many people know that business tax receipt mm -hmm. as an occupational license. Small businesses, home businesses, we can get those business tax receipts issued the same day. There's not a lot for us to, to check on those. When it comes to a business in a commercial property, we have to have a zoning review to make sure it's properly zoned for, for, for the, that business. Mm -hmm. We also have to have code enforcement inspection, fire department inspection, and sometimes we have to have a police department sign off. So those businesses take a lot a longer time for us to get the business tax receipt issued. And again, it's just for the safety of the public in general, isn't it? It really is to make sure that people who are, are um, in business are actually meeting the, the requirements of city code. But really, the business tax receipt is, it's, it's a tax for the, for the right to have a business in the city of West Palm Beach. So like many other cities, the city of West Palm Beach assesses a business tax. And what would that run approximately if you had, say, a retail store in Clematis or well, a restaurant? It, it varies based on the size of the business mm -hmm. and um, the type of the business. Some types of business have a business tax receipt uh, uh, fee that is higher. Mm -hmm. Also, if you're talking about retail, the inventory of the retail business affects the amount of the business tax fee. So what we do, because it's complicated, we actually do publish the business tax fee schedule so that's available online and also at our front counter we can always help with uh, with establishing the the, uh, the business tax 
do. It's wonderful having you here today, Robert Brown. Stay with us, we'll have more after this. Across the country, people like you are riding the bus and taking the train, enjoying the benefits of public transportation. It saves you time, money, and reduces highway traffic. Public transportation provides you with the freedom to get to work, to school, and wherever life takes you. At the same time, it creates an economy that is prosperous, so use public transportation. It all adds up to a better life for each of us. This message brought to you by the South Florida Regional Transportation Authority. For those dealing with the daily struggles of caring for a loved one, we hear you. That's why AARP created a community with experts and other caregivers to help us better care for ourselves and the ones we love. Welcome back to West Palm Under Construction. I'm Leslie Garrett. I'm with Robert Creston today, and he's a code enforcement supervisor with the city of West Palm. Welcome. Thank you. Great to meet you. Good morning. What is the function of the code compliance division? Uh, code compliance enforces uh, the code of ordinances for, uh, for example, um, property maintenance codes, uh, housing codes, zoning codes, and business tax uh, receipts, and many other codes. And why is it necessary to have this code compliance division, in your opinion? Uh, the code ordinances are designed to set up uh, standards for uh, structures. Uh, land use mm -hmm. and health and safety issues mm -hmm. and uh, the the code violators uh, diminish their own property values and uh, have ne negatively impact uh, the whole surrounding neighborhoods which uh, blight attracts vermin fire and uh, police uh, criminal activity well is it important then for neighbors to report these infringements on their neighborhood. Sure. The faster they report it, the faster we can address it. Robert, what are some of the most common code violations? Uh, we have uh, overgrowth, uh, vegetation blocking sidewalks, uh, grass over six inches. Uh, we have uh, business tax uh, licenses. Uh, people come into the uh, to the city mm -hmm. and they don't open, uh, they don't get their business tax uh, receipts. Uh, we have uh, housing violations, which may include painting the house, plumbing uh, issues, they're leaking. Uh, so it's aesthetics, too. Yes. It's the way the neighborhood looks and the house looks. Yes. So if that falls out of compliance, they get a call from you or a neighbor that's complaining about a neighbor's yes. house. And what about rental properties that are not renting without a license? Isn't that one of them as well? Yes. Uh, that's to ensure that the they have proper living facilities, uh, it's safe, and mm -hmm. a healthy uh, situation for the, for the renters. What constitutes a chronic nuisance property? How would you describe that? It has to be designated a uh, chronic nuisance. There's, uh, there's uh, some criteria it has to go through, like with the police, it has to be three calls within uh, three months period of time. Would that be too much noise or? Rowdy that, neighbors. That does or include noise, uh, criminal activity. It, it helps that the neighbors are vigilant then. You've yeah. really got to watch what's going on in your neighborhood. It's everybody's duty then. Yes. And how does a chronic nuisance property finally get cited? Is it the policeman that comes out and, and writes a citation? Or what happens next once it's designated a chronic nuisance? It goes to uh, our chronic nuisance officer, Laura mm -hmm. Borsell, and uh, she, she cites it as a chronic nuisance, mm -hmm. and then the, the property owner gets a, a declaration from Laura on what the violations are on mm -hmm. the property, mm -hmm. and then they have, they have to write out uh, a plan to uh, correct those violations. And, and how and long do they have to correct the violation after they've been given a summons, so to speak? Usually they have to be in compliance within 45 days. Mm -hmm. And if they don't? Say if it's an abandoned property in the case of that. Right. Then it goes to a hearing and mm -hmm. this, uh, after we de declare it a nuisance property, it goes to a hearing 
and then we can get a, a service order on it. And what that means is if the property comes out of compliance, like say if it's overgrown or the property, a vacant property uh, becomes open and exposed to the elements or criminals or whatever, uh, we can just write a work order and have it repaired. And that goes on the tax bill at the end of the year and they have to pay the taxes. How long will the property remain as classified as a chronic nuisance? Is there a time yes, frame? Yes, there is a time frame. If there's no uh, uh, nuisances within a year's time, uh, then, then it gets dropped. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And in the case, of, if it changes hands to a new owner, that follows the property and the new owner is notified of, of any violations that he has to correct and then he would have to uh, submit a plan of action uh, to correct the violations. Well, do you get a warning the first time or how big is the fine? Are they very large in uh, scope? There's no, f there's no per se fines. Uh, it's just that all the work that being done on the property goes on your tax rolls and inspection time is added to that. So, so it has to be inspected afterward to make sure that they're now in compliance with this right. ordinance. Very good. And if somebody sees a code violation, who should they call? Is there a phone number that our yes, uh, viewers can call? Viewers can call uh, Code Enforcement at 822-1465. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the main number. Mm -hmm. Or they can call the 822-2222 number. And that's for any, anything that may see, seem that uh, is wrong in the city. Thank you for being with us today. Robert Creston from the Code Enforcement Division. And thank you for being with us today. I hope you'll join us next time with West Palm Under Construction. I'm Leslie Garrett.